Uh, that's the Amara Kaba <laughs> sensation. It's something we're going to be dancing to right through the day. Uh, we're going to be give you some, giving you some dancing moves and all. You know, we are very skilled dancers. Um, Elizabeth has told me that she'll be closing the se se session today with a dance time. Something I'm, I'm sure, sure a lot of people will have to emulate later. But uh, she hasn't known mine. You know, I'm a very skilled man. Hello, I welcome thinking. back. This is Wake Up Sierra Leone here on the um, AYV television and radio. My name is Victor Jones. Now, as we've told you earlier, uh, we still do have Stephen Nabi Rogers, who is Chief Executive Director, uh, African Faith and Justice Network, Washington, D.C., USA. Welcome to the program. Thank you so much for, for welcoming me. It's Thanks. a pleasure having you indeed. Thank you. I want to presume this is your first time coming to the AYV. Oh, absolutely. It is. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Hopefully not the last time. Oh, most Thanks. definitely. Coins. Most definitely. Uh, what brought about this idea? How did you conceive all of this and wrap them together? Okay. Well, thank you. Um, so first, let me just give you a little background of um, our organization. Mm -hmm. We are a Catholic faith-based advocacy network. Okay. We're based in D.C. We've been there for 41 years now. Okay. Uh, we were founded by you know, um, Catholic priests and nuns who had worked in many parts of the continent and who thought, you know, going back to, to the U.S., the idea was to really focus on governance and you know, advocate for good policies from you know within the U.S. Congress, White House, and all of this, so that it impacts Africa in a very good way. And um, as the executive director, so normally I push for those agendas right here in D.C. But we also do work on the continent because part of our work is not just to get those policies in the West to work for us, but also to make sure our own policies, our you know, actually do work here on the continent. So we do empowerment of people, we do advocacy here. And um, some of the issues we work on is um, urban land governance is one of the major issues. So just to come back to the point, so land um, governance, which is um, part of it is land grabbing, has been a major um, problem on the continent. It's wherein you have large multinational corporations or individuals, or in some cases governments, who acquire large tracts of land, mostly in rural areas, and um, they use those lands, whether it's for mining, whether it's for agriculture and um, other industrial activities. And um, many of the times they ship those products back mm -hmm. to the West. And um, the communities where those, in those um, companies are based normally don't really benefit from it. Now, the intention is for them to be able to um, improve their quality of life, have access to good jobs, or you know, have better roads, better hospitals, mm -hmm. better schools. And, Often the agreements include some of those um, basic um, amenities, which really doesn't come to fruition. So we've been working in Ghana, we've been working in um, Cameroon. I just came from Liberia a couple of months ago, where we actually shed light on this. But we also empower communities to make sure that they actually um, realize their potential, their benefits from these. So those are some of the things we do. Here in Sierra Leone, um, we do have multinational institutions here, right? We do have um, the, I, I was just talking recently, just this morning on SLBC about FG Gold mining in, um, in Bo District mm -hmm. in uh, two towns, I think Bao Mao and um, 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 another, there's another small village very close by. And then of course you probably had a story about Sokfin in Pujeon. And, um, and then there is of course Adax which now has, I'm pretty sure have a new name now, they've been metamorphosing over the years in Makeni. So these are just three of several of these. Now, many of these you know, lead up to um, uh, the local communities rising up because some of their, com their agreements normally are not fulfilled. Surface rents are not paid to landowners. And um, in some places, these infrastructure that they had promised don't really materialize. Um, I just came from Bauma, and I just wanted to mention that it's a, small t it's a big town. It's like 17,000 people. But out of that 17,000 people, they only have one running water. It's a one pipe. So, and they don't even have a senior secondary school. So many of their kids have to go to Bowtown, and often they, they drop out of school because those communities realistic can't afford to send their kids to places where they don't live because it's very expensive for them. So we shed light on this. We, we try to empower these communities, and we also try to make sure that government works. You know, how do we improve those policies to make sure that this gap, which is obviously a gap, is actually closed in the interest of the people. So just in a nutshell, those are some of the works we do, and that's really why we are interested in what we're doing here.
For example, in Sierra Leone, there are laws, you know, uh, for example, the Mining Act, which actually, you know, makes provision how communities can benefit from maybe some of these foreign companies who come, especially for the mining companies, you know. So there are laws already existing. How far does your advocacy go with regards to um, the rights of these citizens as against what's already in the books? And that's a good point. So there are laws, you know, um, whether it's, um, it's, um, it's investment, international investment or mining. Let's just talk about that as an example. Mm -hmm. There are laws on how communities are engaged, how the benefits that they get from this and um, what the company's responsibilities are. Now, sometimes those laws don't necessarily lead to real outcomes. Um, one of the things, for instance, you know, I was in, I was, as I said, I went to Baumau last, last week, and um, part of what the community is saying is, look, we, just, we are artisanal miners. This is all what we have done and since 1930 when we discovered gold in this place. But of course, and over those years, we've had companies that have come, and um, we've worked side by side with them. But that is no longer the case. So what is happening now with this current investment strategy, we can't even mine our own goals. We can't, so we only have to rely on surface rents and do something else. In fact, some of us have been displaced. We are now somewhere else instead of in our communities. Um, so what you want to do is to find out why, because artisanal mining is legal in this country. And for a community like that, that's their livelihood. So if you live, if you come from one place where agriculture is a livelihood, government's job is to make sure that you are able to do agriculture. Not everybody is going to sit in the office and do nine to five job. So you want to see where the gap is, if, even if that's true. So part of what we do is to not only to engage the communities, but also to speak with um, um, our lawmakers, speak with our government, those who are in power to implement these policies, to see where are the laws and why, whether these laws are actually, in fact, being um, violated or not. So, you know, so sometimes you will find out that even when those laws are there, either they are not being implemented or maybe clearly there is a gap somewhere that needs to be um, improved. And that's where new policies come in to fill those gaps. As you empower these communities as well, um, some of these lands, you know, are actually owned communally or by large families, you know. And so what is it you say to them? Because sometimes even the disagreement comes in when the money comes for, for land grabbing sometimes. Some are in support of it, others are not. Maybe they call a few family members and, and just settle them in the corner and all. So how or what does your empowerment include for communities, especially uh, in the rural areas? That's a good question. So, you know, my experience back in Ghana, just a couple of months ago, in, um, in, um, in the, there's a part in Ghana where this is very serious case. So some of the issues you said, conflicts between communities, conflict between, fa between families and even landowners, it's one of the major issues that happen as a result of this. So some folks will sell the land and, um, and they wouldn't account for the money. And there are people who actually get the money and for lands that they don't, they don't own. Mm -hmm. So you see these things. So, and you know, we are coming from emerging markets. I wouldn't want to use the word developing countries. We are governance, it's not very strong. Sometimes it's very weak. It's not, it doesn't always work the way it's intended to do. So empowering these communities in the first place is knowing what is their right to the land? Who owns this land? And sometimes you assume you have a right to something you don't. So part of empowerment is actually knowledge about what, you, what you're entitled to and what you're not. So, but then it clears up that bottleneck to be able to understand, for instance, one family sold a land in, 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 in Ghana um, that belongs to another family. And then that becomes an issue that this family would raise up, and sometimes will raise up from the traditional um, level of, um, of, of, um, of accountability up to the central government. We've been able to help them, in some cases, actually reverse these, uh, these trends. And I think there was one instance where an American company, I mean, which is based in New York, it's, uh, it's called Heracruz, it's an agricultural company that went to Cameroon, and they bought huge tracts of land. And you know, which is predatory. So for instance, a hectare of land for a couple of pennies for hundreds of years. So which obviously is a violation of international law to start with, right? So, and these folks were very angry later on. They've signed to a contract that is, that is bad, which they wanted the money. But on the other hand, it's illegal on the other side. So we made sure that this shouldn't happen. And Heracruz, after 
many years of advocacy, they actually had to relinquish those lands. The community rose up. They were able to actually push back and get their own property, which they now use for their own basic agriculture. So what we are basically saying is sometimes these communities are not strong enough in terms of legal issues, even understanding the complications um, coming from land, from land ownership. I am not even, <laughs> I'm not even complicated enough for that. Mm -hmm. So I can assume someone who is living in my village in Gyeong who doesn't even know what, I mean, how to go into those kind of contracts. So our job is to make sure that the, the agreement is equitable, it's fair, and where it is not, to actually raise advocacy around it and push that. So some of these issues have, you know, deafening political undertones, which I'm sure perhaps you've observed since you came. And um, dealing with these issues would mean um, um, confronting those, you know, at the top, you know, the big dons. Are you prepared for this kind of fight? Well, we are. And, you know, we are a civil society organization. And, you know, I... I, I'm always fighting the U.S. government, so there's no way I can fight my own government where I was born. I mean, I'm not even worried about that. That's the least of my concern. But the way we see ourselves, we're a civil society organization, and um, we see government has an important role in this. And we don't come from a position where you assume that maybe yes, government is trying to do something. Wrong. Sometimes this is governance, so the process of improving governance is very incremental. And, you know, it's like looking at policy gap. How can we improve that? And we see that all the time, whether it's women's rights, whether it's a child's rights, and you bring up new policies to make sure to replace the ones that have not been working well. So we do that sometimes, and we do succeed. So the idea is to be able to get a collaborative process. So one of the things, for instance, I'm going to meet government officials um, next couple of days, and to look at some of the concerns that have been raised by the community. And from the government side, what you, you listen to where that can be resolved. And I think um, sometimes they are, they, are, they, are open to, they are open to new ideas. Where you have issues where governments are not, then and that becomes problematic. And this is where the community itself gets empowered to take up their own actions, to be able to raise those in a very legal way, not necessarily in a confrontational way. Let's talk about the how, you know. Um, how would you be capacitating something you spoke about earlier before we for sport, you be capacitating these communities. Now you've seen the dangers, you've seen the and the catastrophe. Um, how can you salvage it? So, so we are advocacy network. So part of our strategy is we, you know, we train the communities. Casey, okay. um, the idea is for it to be sustainable. First stage, for instance, these town halls which we've held, which is part of informing, is to also listen to them and to understand the needs coming from them. So once we have done a very comprehensive review of what is happening, listening at it from the different stakeholders, the government, the you know other other folks who are doing work like this, there was always to go back to these communities and help them mobilize. I mean, work on specific strategies. Now, the way government works is every constituency have their leaders, they have their MPs, they have, you know, and they're up to the level of a state house in Sierra Leone. So those folks, we engage them like we have, we have done in Ghana in terms of specific issues. Now, we've had places where these communities don't feel represented, and that has always been the case in many countries where, you know, they feel like, oh, our MP probably is, is part of the problem, or he's not communicating with us, or the paramount chief, or the local chief or the town chief. Mm -hmm. Now, so you, the idea is to next to the next level in terms of who, how can we get there. Mm -hmm. We've often engaged directly with government officials, wherein we've helped them provide policy frameworks that actually leads to these changes. So there are different strategies that we do. We've had places where, so, where the communities have actually written letters, engaged their own stake, their own, their own leaders, and actually led to some outcome. Mm -hmm. I was in, um, there's a town, a village, small village called Kanule in Ghana, um, in, in Ghana's Volta region, so where the community, you know, they had this huge, um, it's a distillery f um, factory there. And part of the problem was, it wasn't just that they took the entire land where the community lived, they were actually putting a lot of industrial water into their main drinking source, which was just the water that was running by. So many of the folks were getting sick, they had all this, so you could see them visually. We went to the hospital and we found that within the hospital from just the clinical um, reports that this was a major issue there. 
So, you know, so we, we, we brought them together. They went, they met their local uh, representative with data, with facts, you know. And frankly, it was very interesting because he himself was very concerned after he was faced with this. So he, so he took it up. Eventually, they were able to get some resolutions wherein this particular distributor farm was able to, you know, provide clean drinking water for this community, mm -hmm. move away from, you know, putting water into, I mean, um, industrial water into their main drinking source. So you could get them to do specific things depending upon what the need is because every community has a different need. You know, like what we're talking about here in Bauma, we're talking about the mining industry where for them, obviously, it's just meeting some of their own CSRs, which is a corporate social responsibility that they, sat, they, they acted on, I mean, they signed on. Mm -hmm. So you could get them to say, look, hold them to this. Mm -hmm. And they have, by the way. And i give you one example. According to them, now this is according to them, um, FGGO had agreed to, to, to I think, to, to, to provide 800 jobs in this town. And as of now, from their own counting, I think, I know this is not official, they said it's less than 50. And in fact, the majority of the folks who are hired are just at very minimal age, like, you know, just manual labor. So even when they apply for much higher positions, they don't get the jobs. And it always comes back and says, you're not qualified. Now, what did they do? They said they came together, all the young people, they created the database of their own folks with their actual qualifications, did that proactively. Mm -hmm. And then they sent that to the company. They said, look, here is a group team from, uh, uh, here is where you can hire from. Here are the folks, these are their qualifications. I thought that was very powerful. Mm -hmm. So when you face people with the facts, right, provide that to them, you actually let them really um, act on that. Mm -hmm. So these are non-confrontational issues, but this is really based on um, actual numbers that you've had. So that, those are some of the things that we do in okay. these communities. So as we try to wrap up this conversation, Stephen, what are the key um, actions you would recommend to the Sierra Union government or even international organizations, steps to try to address um, land grabbing, you know, which mm -hmm. actually affects the livelihood of even the citizens or locals in these communities. Good. And so here's how, here's what we do. And this is just public information for anyone who is listening mm -hmm. to this, um, to watching this TV. Sierra Leone's population is 8 million as we speak today, I think from what I read from last statistics. When I was going to school, I think um, they said our land mass was at 27,000, now they're on 25 square miles. I don't know if it has improved. It has increased, but I would be surprised if it has because land doesn't increase, right? Mm -hmm. It's very fixed. Population increases over year. Now think about this very land mass that we have. 27,925 square miles, which you and I, when we were kids, we learned it in primary school, right? Now, our population wasn't 8 million. It was probably 4, 5 million, depending upon which year you were born. Now, the land still remains the same number. The population has increased. Think about it. We are going to be twice this population, still on the same land mass. So if this level of land acquisition by multinational corporations, whether they are Chinese farms coming, if they take half of that in the next 20 years, as we have seen in other countries. So we might be sharing only half of that land with the number we would have got at that time. So land is critical to our people. It's critical to our country. Our people, this is all they have. For many folks in the rural communities, this is what they will give back to their children. They have nothing. They don't have homes. They don't have much education. But the land that they till on is what they will leave for others, for generations to come in. Now, many multinational corporations in other parts of Africa, when they buy this land, we don't even know what they are putting under the land. And we've seen places where these lands can no longer grow what they used to grow. We have no idea. And so it becomes very important. I mean, very, very important that due diligence is done. Someone might come here and say, I'm doing agriculture. But probably they're doing toxic dumping. We are not sophisticated enough to be able to detect those things. And there is a lot of demands for those kind of terrible industries. So the idea here is to be, to be very conscious about it. Why is Africa, 44% of land grabbing happening in Africa? A continent that already is in need of food, in need of clean water, and all of that. So, there, so from a government perspective, it's to be very aware of all of this, but also even more importantly, to focus on policies. We need business here as well. And I do understand that's what governments are concerned about. But we have to do it in such a way that we don't risk the only natural resource that we have. We cannot multiply this land. There's nothing we can do about what we have. So we have to make sure that we protect it. And okay. that's the main reason, job that we do. All right. Well, um, he's uh, Stephen Nabi Rogers, and he's the executive director, uh, African Faith-Based and Justice Network.
um, in Washington, D.C., USA. Now, this organization is a Pan-African Catholic faith-based, you know, org uh, based in Washington that is shedding light on um, um, inhuman practices like land grabbing, uh, which has uh, displaced a lot of communities in the interiors or rural areas of Sierra Leone. They are doing this across the globe. And this is, um, you know, them replicating this in Freetown, which is by extension his home. And this is why, indeed, I uh, would say valet, you <laughs> know. Uh, <laughs> do you understand Latin anyway? No, please. Okay, well, you Except say, for my Latin magazines, but no. Okay, well, you say valet, it's like goodbye. <laughs> okay. <laughs> valet, so gracias to be a girl. That is, thank oh, wow. you very much. Wow, for me, I don't speak French, it's just a little... You see, that's a problem, français? because I don't understand French. <laughs> I don't understand French, but we're surely going to dance to um, a legend later. You had promised us that you would dance. No, people do make their promises. <laughs> Are you the kind of person? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, so this is the end of um, Wake Up Salon for this week. It's been quite interesting, uh, mind spiking, you know, engaging, you know, and uh, in a way, quite. Um, Problem solving. This is where most of the, you know, nuggets of um, information information are gotten. You know, um, the leaders watch these programs, um, policy framers, mm -hmm. you know, and leaders watch our programs and they take cue from some of what we discuss. The okay. people who come with in our studio, you know, the insight, you know, um, try as much as possible to make meaningful contributions locally, <laughs> as way they can improve, you know, democracy and uh, national progress and so want to appreciate you indeed um, our viewer and listener um, for taking the time um, listening to us um, on OIB TV and radio uh, we do appreciate your time and guest as always and my name is Victor Jones and I am Elizabeth Momo of course like uh, Victor mentioned we're here at the end of the week and God is Friday TGIF we encourage you as you go about your weekend find some time to rest. I always say that to my listeners on radio and of course today you have to tune in to TGIF on AYV Radio 101.7 FM. It's at 5 p.m. I'll take you through the drive time show. So keep it locked to AYV TV channel 33 and also RDS TV channel 399. Yes. And, and, and Radio 101.7 FM. Let's remind them to attend uh, the show. Of course tomorrow. Yes, tomorrow Saturday at is it, um, Golden, Olive Garden. Olive, Olive Garden, Garden at Lonely Beach. Olive Garden. Yes, to beach. celebrate a legend. It's just Amara Kaba. That is nothing, you know. Let's support our legend Amara Kaba. <laughs> like and get the ladies on the road. <laughs> as much as you can tomorrow. Of course. It's goodbye. <laughs> and we, we would want, we would actually call for Lady on the Road anyways by Amara Kaba. Oh, yes. Probably because I'm being called that. So yeah, here. It, it's you are the lady on our road here. <laughs> All right. Have a, have a lovely weekend.